clear on that. You know, Anna is wondering about the stability of change and, and what happens. Um, of course, uh, oftentimes we wish that we would somehow be purified by transformative therapy and have no defenses or whatever, but I've actually never met anybody who's been purified, including myself, in case you were wondering. So I'm definitely not purified. So if you're looking for a purified therapist, purified results, purified person, this is not your lecture. You're with Mr. Unpurified here today. So there we have it. <clears throat> so what do we mean then when we help patients with defenses? There's one thing, Anna says, well, you always have them. <clears throat> well, that's an interesting thing. Like if I was in the room with you and I, <clears throat> and I would say I handed you my glasses case, and right, so I could hand this to Anna Marie, in Inga Marie rather, and Inga Marie would take my glasses case and she would hold it herself and says, no, you can't have it, John. Now, Inga Marie could take my glasses case I'm sorry, I think there's some construction nearby. So she could take my glasses case <clears throat> because it's a thing. But no one can take your defense because the defense is how you handle feelings. So for instance, I've had about 20 years of therapy myself. And if I want to project today on Inga Marie, I can. No one can take that away. If I want to intellectualize with Amir, I can. Let's suppose I'm with Samantha and I want to go to self-attack. I can do it. Although Samantha would wonder, John, why are you going to self-attack? Right. Defenses are ways we handle with feelings. Those options are always available. It's just like as a driver, you always have the option to drive in reverse rather than go forward. So the important thing is know we can't take defenses away. They're choices about how to handle feelings. So... <clears throat> Ideally, the therapy is going to help patients see their defenses. Ideally, pay therapy will help patients face their feelings rather than use defenses and be able to deal with conflicts more successfully. And indeed, that's what we see in good therapy outcome. However, if we're under a lot of stress, if there's a crisis, yes, those defenses might pop up again. Sure. But then hopefully we can see them, grab hold of them. See, uh, see what the feelings are we're struggling with and continue. So remember, it's not that they're eradicated. They will be, always be choices available to us. They might come up at a time of crisis or whatever. And that's definitely what we see that there's a lot of psychoanalytic research that shows, yes, that will come up again. And the same thing can happen. I've seen people who've had very transformative ISTV experiences. If there was a huge stressor in the future, yes, they would struggle a little bit at those moments. Because remember, we're helping patients be able to embrace and deal with their, uh, uh, deal with their humanity. And no therapy is going to offer patients omnipotence or omniscience. Life is, life is hard. And when life is very hard or there's a crisis, yes, we, we will probably struggle at those moments. So to have a in other words, it's important to have kind of a realistic view that, uh, first of all, defense is not a thing, it's a choice, it's a way of handling feelings, and that therapy gives us resilience, but it doesn't give us omnipotence, it doesn't give us omniscience. See, early on in psychoanalysis, the idea was of cure, and I knew people said, yes, I've been analyzed, as if they're, they suddenly were aware of everything inside themselves, but it's precisely the nature of the unconscious that we'll never be entirely aware of, of, of our unconscious, because it's unconscious, and in a way, that's kind of an exciting thing, is that we'll always be learning things about ourselves. I'm sure all of you, for those of you, uh, for those of you who are married, uh, your spouses uh, tell you things about yourself that you weren't aware of. We're, we're not always grateful to have that feedback, but they tend to be pointing out something to us that we, we had a blind spot to. And that's why it's so great to have friends or a therapist or a spouse, because sometimes they can help you see uh, a blind spot that you are blind to. So let's go on now to the, um, to the uh, PowerPoint. Let's see. All right, now I wanted, that's not the one I wanted. Share screen, there we go. All right. And, can I end? There, that 
this should make that easier. Okay, so, uh oh, got another question. Let's see. Okay, good, got it. Okay, so what's this theory of ISTDP and causality? Life presents stimuli, all right? There's crisis in life, birth, illness, death, new events, new experiences, a job promotion, a, a, a situation that happens with a friend. And when those stimulus of stimuli arise, they trigger feelings. And that feeling then triggers anxiety. And then that anxiety will trigger defenses in us. And then those defenses cause presenting problems and symptoms. So that's the important thing to keep in mind that there's stimuli in life, the stimuli evoke feelings. If those feelings are previously dangerous or forbidden feelings, those feelings evoke anxiety. And that anxiety then will trigger presenting problems and symptoms. Now, so this is a very different way of diagnosing. As you know, those of us who are in the US use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual number five. In Europe, you use this ICDM 10, right? Now, in that model of diagnosis, you simply give a label to a patient's symptoms. But a description of symptoms does not explain their cause. So this is very important. In, in medicine, when, when there's a, 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 an illness, we have to diagnose what's causing the patient's symptoms. So for example, a very dear friend of mine in Iran recently had very severe symptoms. And of course, he wanted to know what's ca causing the symptoms. Well, they diagnosed and said, oh, you have COVID. COVID explains and causes your symptoms. Then they knew, oh, we need to treat the COVID. Now, in, in psychotherapy, oftentimes people just say, oh, well, you have a fever, right? But saying, and that's like saying someone is depressed. Depression is not a diagnosis because it doesn't tell us how or what is causing the depression. So that's why Davenu came up with this term of psychodiagnosis, because he realized people were describing a symptom like depression or anxiety disorder, but they weren't diagnosing what causes that disorder, because only if you know the cause, can you treat the cause. So this is why this issue of psychodiagnosis is so important. So our theory then is that there's trauma of some sort and attachment that triggers complex feelings towards caretakers. So you have a child that's trying to form a good relationship and something happens in such a way that the patients, um, that the child then is gonna have mixed feelings toward a parent he or she loves. And the problem when you really have <clears throat> genuine trauma is that the parent who should be helping the child is actually the source of danger to the child. And the child realizes, wow, my relationship with mom or dad is my mom or dad is now dangerous to me. And if I share these feelings, that may create more danger. So then the child learns that feelings are dangerous. And the child learns, oh, I can't depend on this parent when they're the dangerous figure. So if I can't depend on my parents for affect regulation, I need to rely on defenses for affect dissociation. Uh, Yuval, is there a way those cues can happen without the sound uh, coming in each time? Yeah. Well, okay. okay, great. Thanks. So, so the child learns is that ordinarily the child, when the child has these troubling feelings, the child could reach out and depend on a parent for affect regulation. But instead, the child learns, oh, I mustn't depend on my parent for affect regulation. I need to rely on defenses to push away those feelings. So what happens is that the child then, out of love for the parent, right, depends on defenses instead of the parent. This is what Jessica Benjamin called the gift of love. So those defenses 
are unconscious. The child is not aware that she's using defense, right? The two-year-old or three-year-old child doesn't say, hmm, should I use projection or intellectualization today? No. These defenses happen automatically. They're always automatic. And if the problem with the parent remains persistent, then this defense becomes persistent and habitual. And that is very adaptive. As the ego psychologist said, the child is forming defenses as a way to adapt to the attachment to the parents. So if this defense helps that attachment, then the child is actually adapting to the attachment by using defenses. So it's very important to understand that the origin of defenses is usually adaptive. That actually defenses have a good and life-saving function early on. The problem is that these defenses that were adaptive in early life are usually very maladaptive in adult life. And that the defenses that um, solved problems in an early relationship create problems in later relationships. So psychoneurosis. So Davenlu was trying to figure out how do we understand then this spectrum of people that we're treating who are not psychotic. So he referred to this as a spectrum of psychoneurosis, right? So if someone that had a, a pretty good background, um, there's no trauma at all. And there's a number of people where there's very little trauma and they will present with low resistance. These are patients where um, their resistance system is isolation of affect. So they can intellectualize uh, from their feeling about their feelings, um, their anxieties and the strided muscles. Um, their, their conflicts are really quite minimal. If they show up into your office, it's usually due to a recent loss and that all you have to do is help them mourn a loss. And just with a little encouragement, they feel a loss, anxiety drops, and it's resolved. And these are these rare patients where they can be seen in just a couple of sessions and, and they're immediately better. Um, they're not very common, but, but they do exist. Then we have patients where there might be a little bit of relational trauma. These are patients where we call them moderate resistance. Now, these are patients where, again, they're using isolation of affect as their resistance system, their anxieties and the strided muscles. Now, when they use isolation of affect, <clears throat> they use isolation of affect as a way to avoid feelings. But they, but they don't use isolation of affect as a way to avoid contact. So this is a patient that will be looking at you. They'll be relating well. When you ask questions, they'll answer the questions. If the patient's struggling, he's really trying to answer your question. It's just defenses interfere with his ability to be aware of a feeling. So this is not real common, but it's more common. I've run into a lot of patients uh, with moderate resistance, for instance, in, in Scandinavia. It's quite, quite common. So again, they have, they're using isolation of affect, but not as a resistance to emotional closeness only as a resistance to feelings. So those of you who've read my book, Co-Creating Change, there's a case I use throughout that book. That is a clear case of moderate resistance. The patient at no point puts up a barrier to emotional contact with me. He's using intellectualization, he's in affect the, the whole time. Now, when there's a little bit more relational trauma in, in the relationship, then we'll see what we call high resistance. Now, these are patients where um, their resistance system, again, is isolation of affect. Their anxiety is in the strided muscles. These people, when they use isolation of affect, they use isolation of affect to ward off their feelings, but also to avoid emotional uh, contact with the therapist. You ask, what's the problem you would like me to help you with? They don't answer your question. If you persist, they say, I don't know, you should ask my wife. She's the one who thought I should come. So you'll get defenses against declaring a problem. Or the patient may present the problem in a vague way. And when you ask the patient to describe um, the, the precipitating event, the patient is unable to. 
So we end up with a strange situation. The patient either doesn't declare a problem or says it very vaguely. And when you try to find out an example of the problem, the patient um, remains quite vague. So what happens is that actually you don't get a problem, you don't get a specific example, so you can't do the phase of inquiry, right? Inquiry is going nowhere. And when you try to explore, uh, you can't explore feelings because you don't really have a clear example. So this is a group where in the beginning of the session, we begin to see that the patient is using the isolation of affect. The patient is using isolation of affect, not just as a defense against feeling, but a resistance to emotional conflict, or to emotional contact rather. So this is high resistance. So when Davenler developed the model of ISTDP, this is the group he was talking about. So the standard format of ISTDP was designed for people who are high resistant, who maintain a barrier with you. Their anxiety doesn't need to be regulated. Their anxiety is in the strided muscles and they use defenses as a way to avoid emotional contact. That was the standard uh, format. And he said that that would work with about 30% um, of patients. Okay, let me need to check and chat. Okay. So Lisa is saying, uh, could, could, you, could you explain how isolation of affect works? Sure. So an isolation of affect, perhaps the patient intellectualizes. So um, Yuval, um, <clears throat> ask me three times what the problem is that I'd like, me, like you to help me with. What's the problem you would like me to talk about? Um, no problem, really. Just, uh, yeah, my wife thought it'd be good if I came here. What's the problem you would like me to help you with? Um, it's kind of hard to say. It's uh, maybe kind of a, a midlife, uh, midlife crisis kind of issue. What's the problem you would like me to help you with? Oh, gosh, I was afraid you asked that. I, I don't know. I was actually, I was kind of hoping maybe you, you could tell me what my problem was. Now, notice in the first example, I don't know, you should ask my wife, right? We're seeing denial and projection of awareness. I'm not aware of my problem, my wife is. Next example, um, I say maybe kind of a midlife crisis. I use vagueness as a way to avoid declaring a problem. And then the third example say, gosh, I don't know, I was kind of hoping you could tell me. I immediately go passive and I take a passive stance. So rather than working together with you all, Right, I take a passive stance and then wait for Yuval to figure out what my problem is. Now, Yuval, let's uh, let's do this one one again. And now, as this uh, person isolation of affect, I'll demonstrate defenses. And Yuval is going to ask me um, three times um, what feelings I have uh, toward my husband. What feelings do you have towards your husband? Um, well, I, I think that, you know, he just, he just had kind of a bad day and it was just, you know, just wasn't, wasn't looking good. What feelings do you have towards your husband? I think it's a, it's a, it's a reaction, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of a reaction, I'd say. Yeah. What feelings do you have towards your husband? Oh, I'd say really angry. Now let's take a look at those defenses, right? So I said, well, maybe, I think he just had a bad day. So the patient doesn't give you her feeling. She gives her reason for his feeling. So that's what we call rationalization. Uh, in the next example, she says, um, I think it was a reaction. So she doesn't offer a feeling, she offers a thought. We would call it intellectualization. In, in, the, in, the, third, in the third example, Oh uh, gosh, can you remember my third example? It's slipping here. Third example. Yeah, angry. angry. All right. So notice, well, so I, I, I gave you all, I said anger, right? And so you might get happy. Oh, great, I got a feeling. But you notice I offered the word, but not the feeling, right? If, I, if, if anger was a feeling, I said, well, I'm angry. And how do you experience that anger? In this case, when I said anger, you would address the defense. You say, well, I, I'm, I'm sure you do, but I notice you don't look angry. You don't sound angry. 
you looked attached and sound attached. Notice how this detachment comes up um, as a way to, to hide your anger. So that would be a way that you'd be drawing the patient's attention to detachment as a defense. So in isolation of affect, we'll see intellectualization, rationalization, vagueness, changing topics, um, and detachment. All these defenses work together to help the patient detach from feelings and detach from you. So this is an example that, that these defenses help the patient isolate the feel, isolate the word from the feeling. That's why we call it isolation of affect. The patient giving you a feeling word, but without the feeling. This is, is typical then in uh, moderate resistance and high resistance isolation of affect. Now, that's not what we're gonna talk about today. Today and tomorrow, we're gonna to be looking at another resistance system, the resistance system of repression. And this is, and as we saw, Davin came up with the idea of the standard format, right? To work with that 30% of patients that's moderately or highly resistant. But then as you know, we've got this other 70% of patients that requires a different treatment model. Because Davin saw the standard format uh, doesn't work with severely depressed or fragile patients or somatizing patients. So he himself realized, okay, that's a standard format, but I need to develop a graded format so that we can be um, working with these patients as well. So with this group then, what we in repression, what we see, the patient actually is not able to detach from feelings. She can't use intellectualization and rationalization to avoid feelings. Instead, she becomes teary, she becomes depressed, she starts having somatic problems. And that's what we call the resistance system for repression. So with these patients, you are often gonna see moderate to severe trauma. And then an even more severe group is the patients that we refer to as fragile. These are patients that rely on splitting and projection. And in fragile patients, their anxiety is discharged in the uh, in cognitive perceptual disruption and where they need a lot of anxiety regulation and where we need to help do a lot of work around the triangle of conflict to build their capacity to tolerate feelings without splitting and projecting and to tolerate mixed feelings without cognitive perceptual disruption. In repression, what we're going to be looking at today and tomorrow, we have patients where they don't, they don't necessarily split or project initially, and, but they can't use isolation of affect. So what they do is they say, I love you, but I'm angry with myself. So they turn anger onto themselves. And what we're gonna see is they do that in the therapy session. They turn anger on themselves in therapy to protect you uh, from their anger. So when we look at the spectrum of resistance, then we're looking at a spectrum of trauma. There are some patients that experience very little trauma of any kind. They're going to be low resistance. Well, some patients where they had severe trauma, and these are patients that tend to be fragile. We're going to see that with moderate in, with high resistance and moderate resistance, the resistance system is isolation of affect. In repression, we're going to see the resistance system repression, where we're going to see self-attack. We're going to see character defenses. We're going to see weepiness and depression and somatic symptoms. In severe trauma with fragile patients, the resistance system is splitting and projection. In isolation of affect, patients' anxieties and strided muscles. In repression, patients' anxiety goes to smooth muscles. In splitting and projection, anxiety goes in the cognitive perceptual disruption. So you begin to see these three different groups have a different resistance system and a different anxiety system. And so then as a result, we can assess what defense system is causing their problems and where is their anxiety discharged. Okay, let me just check to see if chat. Okay. All right, let's go on. So this goes back to Lisa's question earlier about isolation of affect. So the defenses in isolation of affect include intellectualization, where I offer a thought instead of feeling. Rationalization, where I offer the reason for feeling. Well, I think the reason he did that was because you also see diversification, where the patient changes topics rather than offers a feeling. Vagueness, where the patient becomes vague rather than offer a feeling. 
So what's the feeling toward, uh, toward him? Well, it's difficult to say, right? That vagueness is a way to avoid declaring a feeling. Now, the effect of I, these defenses is that the patient ends up being detached from her feelings and also she'll be depressed, but she's going to be depressed because she's in distant relationships. So this is important too. Depression has multiple pathways of causation. So in isolation of affect, you'll have depressed patients. They tend to be mildly depressed and they're not depressed because self-attack. They're depressed because their detachment from others creates detached relationships. So they're depressed because they're disconnected. They don't really feel passionate or close in any relationship. Their anxieties and strided muscles and the relationship that they have with you is the detached one. And so in isolation of affect, you're going to be working a lot with that resistance to emotional closeness. Now in repression, which is the subject of today and tomorrow, Patients will use self-attack. Oh, I'm such an idiot. Or where the patient becomes weepy. Or where the patient is really very depressed. Or a patient reports feeling tired, right? That tiredness is a sign that anxiety is going into the smooth muscles. We'll have the defense of conversion. A patient is momentarily angry with someone, maybe had an unconscious wish to hit someone, and she suddenly can't move her arms or she can't move her legs or she feels her legs suddenly become numb. You'll have the defense of somatization. A patient is angry with her boyfriend and all of a sudden she has stabbing pains in her heart because she had a fantasy of wanting to stab him. I had a patient once, she was engaged to a man and visited him at his apartment, but he was at work and the phone rang and she picked up the phone and the woman on the other end says, who are you? And she identified herself. Well, it turned out that this patient of mine, who was a fiance, discovered that this guy had another fiance. So you can imagine the rise of anger. Ask, and how do you experience that anger toward him? She says, I don't know. It's just, I feel... I don't know, it's, it's, I just feel something weird in my head. So I kept asking about the anger and eventually she felt her anger and then she had this portrayal. And what happened to the portrayal? She took a sword and it went right through his head. That would be a case of somatization. In other words, not only do I turn the anger on myself, the impulse I do to the, his body is unconsciously done to my body. Patricia Coughlin has a lovely case of, of that, which I think you can read in her first book on intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy, that patient felt like something was stabbing her and she had a stabbing pain in the eyes. And later in the portrayal, she took an ice pick, <laughs> icicle and stabbed this man in his eyes. So it's a really good example where the patient identifies with the body of the person she wants to attack. Also in repression, it gets uh, character defenses. So if a patient grew up with parents who ignored her, she ignores herself. If she grew up with parents who verbally abused her, she'll verbally attack herself. If she grew up with parents who devalued you, she'll devalue herself. So rather than feel angry at her parents, she'll use their attack in the service of self-attack. So it's really a form of what Anna Freud called identification with the aggressor, that I do to myself what someone did to me. And this is a very important defense because it wards off rage toward the original attacker. Now, what's the effect from repression? The effect is that the patient will become depressed as a result of self-attack. The patient's gonna suffer from chronic anxiety in the gut, and the patient's gonna be suffering from a lot of somatic symptoms, oftentimes due to con uh, conversion or due to somatization. The patient's anxiety is in the smooth muscles. Now, remember in isolation of affect, we said that the relationship was, I detach from you. In repression, the message is, I love you, I hate myself. So again, notice the patient isolation of affect can avoid mixed feelings from detaching from mixed feelings. But the person in repression who can't detach, she'll say, no, I love you. And I'm going to protect you from my anger by turning it on to myself. Now, this is very important that now you can understand repression is not just a defense. 
It's a relational strategy. I love you. But to protect you whom I care for, I'm going to protect you from my anger by turning it on myself. And when I turn the anger on myself, that's how I love you. Okay, so this is very, very important then to understand that self attack is not just a defense, it's a way to protect you in the service of preserving the relationship. Very often therapists are addressing self attack only as a defense, but they're failing to address that, that it's a relational strategy. And this is very important because we have to work with this relational strategy in therapy so that the patient doesn't engage in self attack in other relationships to protect other people she loves. And we've got a bunch of, okay, let's, uh, let's uh, go, let me check up on these questions. Are there character defenses and isolation of affect? That's a great, great question from Reza. Yes, they can come up in isolation of affect, but usually the patient is detached when they do the, use those defenses. So the, the fact is what you need to address is that treat them as thoughts and as a barrier to emotional closeness. So in, in character defenses have to be dealt with directly when we're dealing with someone in repression. In isolation of affect, however, oftentimes we have to deal with them as barriers to closeness. So if you're not sure, talk about the character defenses and invite feelings toward you. Uh, see if that resolves or uh, address, or if that doesn't work, then address the character defenses as a wall of thoughts and then ask for feelings toward you. So you could address it first as a defense or address it later as a transference resistance. So uh, Andrew is saying, with regard to character defenses, is, is that the same idea of enactments either in the therapy or in one's life? Do character defenses lend to a transference resistance in the therapy? Well, important thing to remember, all, all defenses, right, all defenses are memories. I'm just letting you register that, right? If the patient detaches from you, the patient oftentimes is showing you how someone detached from them. If a patient attacks herself, she's oftentimes showing you how she was attacked. Or she's shown you how she learned to attack herself in order to maintain a connection. If a patient projection splits, oftentimes the patient is showing you how she grew up in a home where there was splitting and, and projection. So keep in mind, a defense, a defense is always a memory of adaptation. So in a way, every defense in a way is a way of relating to you. And every defense in a way is, is an, an enactment of a kind of relationship with you. So that's why, for instance, in isolation of affect, if the patient takes a detached stance, we'll say, notice how you put up this wall, the detachment, and then we would have the same distant relationship here that you have with your wife and that you had with your father. So can we see what feelings are coming up here toward me uh, that are making good distance here from me? So in that way, you're beginning to address the way the patient is enacting a past relationship with you. When, when you point out, could the, in, in the case of character defense, the patient says, oh, I'm such an idiot, uh, we'll, we'll go right to defense work. Could that thought be hurting you? So rather than listen to this patient's self-attack, right? Because the patient learned I should attack myself and then my mother will calm down. So when the, instead, when the patient goes self-attack, we'll say, oh, could that thought be hurting you? Could that thought be unfair to you? Since that thought is hurting you in our relationship, the enactment, could we see what feelings are coming up here toward me if we look underneath those thoughts? Yeah, what feelings are coming up toward me? That's why when you invite feelings, you're always inviting a new relationship rather than repeat the old relationship. When you invite feelings toward you, you're encouraging the patient to no longer detach and repeat his past but to have feelings towards you. In repression, when you invite feelings toward you, you're saying to the patient, you don't have to hurt yourself with me. We could have a new relationship where you'd have feelings toward me. So remember, inviting feelings is actually inviting a new relationship. It's blocking an old enactment. And that enactment through using defenses is gonna cause patient symptoms.
So indeed, self-attack character events is, is a beautiful example of how the patient is enacting a past history of self-neglect. Well, I don't pay attention to my anxiety. Right. And if you ignore your anxiety, then that, that would prevent us from being able to regulate it. Yeah. And, and, if, and if, well, yeah, but I don't want to look at it. Right. Well, if you don't look at your anxiety and I don't look at your anxiety, then, then what kind of relationship would we have if, if we both ignore you? See, that's addressing the enactment. So since you're inviting me to hurt you and ignore you, the transference enactment, I wonder what feelings are coming up here toward me. Because you see, again, it's not just the patient's inviting, ignoring her anxiety. She's inviting you to do that. She's inviting an enactment. That's where we have to keep our attention. So given that you're inviting me to hurt you, can we see what feelings are coming up here toward me? So that's a, you see the beauty of your question there, Andrew, is that these defenses are always enacting past relationship. And so we're having to think about how do we bring that to patient's attention and how do we make sure that our interventions are offering a new relationship rather than repeating the old relationship? Okay, now let's see, I think, uh, can you please clarify the subject of muscles in understanding ISTDP? Oh yes, now I understand your question, I hope. Yes, um, when anxiety is in the strided muscles, it, the, these muscles are, are, you could say they are your voluntary muscles. So when a patient is anxious, they'll sigh. So that's tension in the intercostal muscles. They'll oftentimes tense up in their shoulders. So another way to say this is that their anxiety is discharged in the somatic nervous system. So the central nervous system involves the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. So the somatic system is involved with what we call also voluntary muscles or strided muscles. We call them strided muscles because under a microscope, when you look at them, there's certain kinds of striations, there's lines in them. Key thing for you to be aware of is that the, in isolation of affect, the patient tenses up. Their, and since their anxiety is in the somatic nervous system, it doesn't need to be regulated. It, it is regulated. So for patients isolation of affect, you don't have to regulate anxiety. Now, when anxiety is in the smooth muscles, these are the muscles that line the digestive system and they also line the blood vessels. So that's why someone, uh, so that's so when the muscles in the digestive system are mobilized, that's part of what would cause patients to have um, problems in the smooth muscles where they might start to have nausea in the stomach or get sick to their stomach. They might um, start to have diarrhea. They feel the need to go to the bathroom. Um, uh, where they might start to uh, have, a, have a migraine headache. So um, in, my, in my book, Co-Creating Change, um, I have about 100 pages just on anxiety, and it talks about these pathways of anxiety. One of which is the strided muscles I just described. Another is the pathway of smooth muscles, which align the digestive tract and blood blood vessels. And the third track is cognitive perceptual disruption. So if you go back to that book, Co-Creating Change, it's got a hundred pages, just dealing with that. And for others of you who've read that book, you could also see a lot on anxiety in my book, Co-Creating Safety, that also goes into some new things uh, in there. Um, now, Ron is saying, is it possible to see smooth muscle anxiety together with uh, defenses of isolation of affect or self-attack together with strided muscles. Absolutely wrong. And that's part of it. One of the things we're gonna be looking at today, and actually it's gonna be one of the things we'll be looking at in a presentation I'm giving in Australia um, later this month, I forget when. Um, so you can have smooth muscle anxiety with isolation of affect defenses. For instance, a patient's got smooth muscle difficulties, but they're intellectualizing. Yes. Now, Ram, here's the key thing. If you have anxiety in the smooth muscles and the patient's intellectualizing, you can keep pressing for feelings. But if you have smooth muscle activation and the patient has no ability to intellectualize and smooth muscles and they're doing self-attack, then you've got to address self-attack. So this, this is an important kind of detailed uh, thing. Now, can you have self-attack together with strided muscles? Yes. Now, when you have self-attack and patient's anxiety and strided muscles, again, you can press for feelings. And, uh, and what you can do is oftentimes the patient will say, yeah, I'm just a piece of crap. 
but they'll say it in a detached way. In that case, we're not going to address the self-attack. We're going to address the detachment. It's the wall of attachment. So you know, self-attack, uh, it's just a bunch of crap. Then you're going to address attachment. You get a self-attack and patient really gets it repressed. Then you have to address self-attack. So great, uh, great questions here. All right, so now I'm going to come back. So let's take a look. We're, we're going to look now at the function of the systems of resistance. So an isolation of affect. So this helps you see when we talk about, there's a lot of defenses, right? Everybody uses defenses. And my work around the world is showing me, we use the same defenses around the world. It's, it's fascinating. Everywhere in the world, you see these defense systems. And what happens is that all defenses actually fit into three systems. And each of these systems correlates with the pathway anxiety discharge. So this is the overall pattern governing uh, psychological functioning. Isolation of affect, I detach from you to detach from the feelings our relationship triggers. In repression, I try to avoid mixed feelings toward you. I can't detach. So I say, I love you, I hate myself, I'm a piece of crap. In projection and splitting, to avoid my mixed feelings, I split them apart and I'll either project the love or the rage on you. If I project my anger onto you, I could be afraid of you, or I could be angry thinking that you're angry with me and trying to track, attack me, or I might get depressed thinking, oh, you hate me, but I won't be relating to you. I'll be relating to the feeling I have projected onto you. I'll be interacting with a projection. These are the three basic patterns. Now, this is a lot to digest, so let me make your life a little easier now, and we'll go to another point here. So, sorry about that. Why is that happening? Hmm. all, I can't seem to get my share system, screen. If you are looking for the system of resistance. Then yeah. yeah I got it. I got okay. You. All right. Let me, I'll try. For some reason, yeah, I can't get it to show up. Okay. Why don't you share? John, have you recently updated your Zoom? Oh, I don't remember. No, I'm, I'm asking that because uh, your doesn't give Zoom the permission for you to share your screen. I see. If you want, we can we can check that out. Would you like okay. to check it out now or? Sure. So what do I what do I do? I just uh, check. Uh, Did you go to system preferences? Yeah. Are you there? Uh, that's just some references within uh, within Zoom. No, 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 no. Where the the Apple logo is on your Mac. Oh, go there. Okay. Have it in the meantime. Oh, okay. All right. Well, so l l let me do that in just a minute because here, here we've got the systems of resistance here showing up. So this okay. really well, this really helps you see now. Uh, if you go across the top, there's splitting and projection. There's repression. And there's isolation of affect. Those are the three patterns by which patients ward off feelings. So Davenu developed this model of, uh, of therapy, ICDP, and his first model he developed was a standard format. It was just for highly resistant patients, isolation of affect. So as you see, the strategies that patients detach from the person to detach from internal feelings. And so within isolation of affect, uh, in moderate resistance, they'll use intellectualization, rationalization, tactical defenses to ward off feelings. But in high resistance, the defenses operate together to form a pathological relationship that we call the transference resistance. That's where we talk about the wall. That's what Davin was talking about. Result is these patients are very detached with you. They're very detached with everyone. 
their anxiety and striated muscles. And the spectrum, like I said, is that you'll have moderate resistant patients that ward off feelings. You'll have highly resistant patients where they ward off emotional closeness. Now, the patient I'm going to talk about today and the one tomorrow, these are patients where the strategy is turn rage on the self to avoid mixed feelings toward you. And their defenses, they'll use self-attack, weepiness, depression, tiredness, which is a form of anxiety, conversion, somatization, character defenses. The result is these patients are depressed or they're chronically anxious. Anxiety goes in smooth muscles and the spectrum is there in repression. It can be mild or it can be quite severe. Now, uh, in projection and splitting, what happens, patients can't detach, they can't intellectualize, so they separate mixed feelings and they'll relocate an internal feeling onto an external person, right? So they'll project onto you. They'll split off a feeling, say, that, that has nothing to do with me. Uh, so they'll use splitting projection, they'll use projective identification. <coughs> That's where they try to make you feel angry so they don't feel angry. They may split and regard you as all bad and engage in devaluation. They may split and view you as all good and idealize you. Or they may project on you and then they'll act out as if they're acting out toward a projection. For instance, if they judge themselves, they may think you're judging them. And so, what are you looking at? And they wanna, might want to punch this person who wasn't judging them. And then we have discharge, which is why people oftentimes have trouble tolerating feeling inside. So they'll yell to get the feeling out of them, or they'll curse to get the feeling out of them. And the result is patients will either be angry at a person they project on, or they're scared of you because they projected onto you. Their anxiety is in cognitive perceptual disruption. And these are patients we call fragile. My um, book, Co-Creating Safety, is really how to work with the graded format in repression and fragility. So that, that can help you. So if you have these kinds of patients where they go into repression or they're fragile, then co-creating safety is the book for you. Now, uh, Gergen asked, oh, and Stacy asked about conversion. I mentioned that earlier, Stacy. What it refers to is when a patient, suppose she's really angry and she wants to hit someone, she finds that she can't, uh, that she can't move her arm. Or a patient of mine was so angry with her husband, she fell on the floor. She literally couldn't walk. She lost the use of her legs. Now, what did she want to do when we had the portrayal? She wanted to kick him. So because of the guilt over wanting to kick him, she lost the use of her legs. Um, uh, and you're going to say, in what way is tiredness another way of form anxiety? Tiredness, yes, is very consistent, Gergen, with the smooth muscle anxiety, right? Because if tension moves out of the strided muscles, right? Yes, and the patient is starting to have anxiety in the smooth muscles, that means anxiety is going into the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. And that means that blood pressure is dropping, pulse rate is dropping, breathing rate drops, and you have neurohormones being released in the brain all of that is going to create the symptoms of tiredness. That's why pressure is so important with patients who are tired, because when you start doing pressure to feelings and buy them have feelings, it's going to trigger anxiety more in the striated muscles. And then their heart rate and their pulse rate and their breathing rate is going to improve. And then the tiredness should uh, go away within a minute or two. Okay. Let's now let's see if I can share. If you can drop your share there, you have all I'll go back to my uh, now. Let's see if this works. Okay, good. So this was a system of resistances. So this is very important that you understand an ISTDP that we're talking about three systems of resistance. They correlate with three pathways anxiety. Isolation of affect, we use as the standard format of ISTDP, the classic form for highly resistant patients. In repression, we use a kind of graded format I'll show today and tomorrow. And in projection and splitting, we use another kind of graded format to build capacity. So pathways anxiety discharge. This may be repetitious for some of you, but for those of you who are new to this, anxiety is not just a, a thought in your head. It's an experience in the body and it's mo motivated actually by the amygdala that triggers 
the somatic nerve, the central nervous system. So the amygdala triggers the central nervous system, and that's going to trigger anxiety in the body. And so when anxiety goes in the body, it can go in the strided muscles, the somatic nervous system, it can go in the smooth muscles or in cognitive perceptual disruption. Both of those mean that the parasympathetic nervous system has been activated. Now, that's, that's a lot of gobbledygook. Let me get clearer here for you. So anxiety discharge, strided muscles, patients' thumbs and hands will clench. You'll see their thumbs moving like this, or you'll see their hands like this. Their shoulders are up. You might see them move their neck, you know, because their neck is tense. These are patients that report having tension headaches. Um, when you ask for feelings, you'll hear them sigh. That means there's tension in these intercostal muscles. They'll report having tight stomach muscles, tension in feet and legs, and sometimes you'll have fibromyalgia or hyperventilation. Okay, now I notice there's something in chat. Right. Yes, thank you for advertising. You've all co-creating safety belt in Hebrew. Now, smooth muscles, th these are the muscles that line the gastrointestinal tract. So patients will talk about feeling sick to the stomach, have stomach ache, uh, sometimes they get nauseous. These are patients that might talk about that they threw up, uh, when they threw up in a particular situation. Uh, they might have trouble breathing due to constriction of the bronchi. These are patients who oftentimes have to go to the bathroom, they'll leave the session or they'll report having diarrhea all the time or loose stools. Um, they might report having irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's disease. These are very common concomitants that accompany smooth muscle anxiety. Um, then you'll also have uh, smooth muscles in, in the bl blood vessels. And so that will oftentimes give rise to migraines. Now, not all migraines are emotionally caused, but if you're doing a rise of feelings, and the patient gets a migraine, oftentimes that's a sign that anxiety is going to the smooth muscles. Another sign Devin talked about is jelly lights. What does that mean? Well, strided muscles to make you tense up. So if anxiety goes out of the strided muscles, your legs will no longer be tense. And so the patient will be a little unsteady on their legs. Or you'll notice, if, for instance, those of you who have very severely ill patients, notice how they kind of shuffle into the office. Office. Their balance isn't good. They're not steady on their feet. And that's because they're they already, their anxiety is not in strided muscles. That's why their legs are not tense. That's why they're not steady on their feet. Cognitive perceptual disruption. This is where anxiety has risen to such an extent. Blood flow has dropped to the brain. Less oxygen is getting to the brain. You actually have what we call hypoperfusion of the prefrontal cortex. Literally, the part of your brain that does this thinking doesn't get enough oxygen. Patient actually has problems thinking, has problems with memory. Um, you will see that the patient may lose track of her thoughts, not due to defense, just simply the anxiety is making her brain not work. She'll report having blurred vision, ringing in the ears. Um, maybe there's a loss of other senses. Um, I think I, I presented a case, I think last year where a patient would with a rise of anxiety, uh, would suddenly become blind in session. Um, and these are patients where they might start to hallucinate. They frequently get dizzy, right? Due to the drop in blood pressure to the brain, they get dizzy and they'll faint. And we'll see the defensive conversion. Since there's no tension, oftentimes your fragile patients will feel appear physically calm, but they're cognitively confused. Any of you have worked with a, a psychotic patient, very oftentimes your psychotic patient looks very flat. And you might think, oh, this patient is very uh, relaxed. No, actually their anxiety is going to cognitive perceptual disruption and they look really flat because no anxiety is going into uh, uh, the strided muscles. There's literally no tension that you see in the body. Now, um, Ehud is saying smooth muscles in life, but not in the therapy. If there's smooth muscles in life, but not in the therapy, that would suggest to me that you need to invite more feelings because what happens if the patient is, reaches such a level of feelings in life that she starts to anxiety going into smooth muscles, that is her threshold. That's where she gets into trouble. 
And I'll get into that in a moment. But the key thing, Ehud, is that if she is reaching that th threshold in life, it means you probably need to do more pressure and therapy so you can reach that threshold because that's where she gets into trouble. So it means you need to do a longer phase of pressure. Now, uh, Wei Ling is saying, uh, how could you just explain how fainting is from stride of anxiety versus uh, cognitive perceptual disruption? So you might have, you might have fainting um, in isolation of affect, but it's probably going to be due to some hyperventilation. To, to know if it's an isolation of affect, see what are the defenses that are happening before the patient faints? Is she, is she intellectualizing, rationalizing, or is she splitting and projecting? So if the patient faints and you're or fainting, feeling faint, notice what are the defenses she used before? Because if she was using splitting projection and they fail, she'll faint. If she was using isolation of affect, they fail, she faints. So look at your, always correlate your anxiety symptom with the defense system that, that you, that's operating. Amir is saying, how can we, um, can we distinguish detachment or resistance emotional closeness from dissociation due to fragility? Same thing. Look at what the defenses are the patient is using. Is the patient using det detaching, isolation of affect, intellectualization, or is the patient using splitting and projection? Okay. Henning, so can you say something about resistance system in different patients with severe obsessive disorder? Oof. Okay, so Henning is asking a very high-end question here. Obsessive disorder, you could, their obsession of disorder is a spectrum disorder. Uh, there are patients that are at a, a fragile level of character dis, a, dis structure. You can even have psychotic patients that will have uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. So what you're really having to look at is what not just their OCD, but you're having to look at what is, you're having to look at them holistically. What is the resistance system patient using? Is the patient using splitting and projection? If so, then you're going to be working with splitting and projection to build capacity. The, oh, the OCD is basically a symptom or a defense, higher level defense that is failing. And that's why it becomes so much more active. It's failing because it's, it's not able to manage the feelings and anxiety that are rushing up. So you've got to address anxiety regulation and work on splitting and projection to build capacity. You wouldn't work in the OCD. You'd work on the splitting projection because that's a fundamental structural problem. I haven't seen OCD come up in, um, in, in repression. So that's not a question I can answer. Isolation of affect, of course, we get it there. Uh, there, you would address the obsessional thoughts as a wall of thoughts that are keeping you at a distance. Um, uh, uh, Rachel says, does deviation of the corneas and the eyes mean cognitive perceptual disruption? Um, deviation is probably not the word you meant. Um, in, in, Yes. So in, uh, I'm trying to remember now. Yes. So in, if you, if you look at uh, co-creating change or co-creating safety, I go into this and forgive me if I'm not remembering correctly, but I believe in, I, I believe, yes, I, I believe it's in, I believe it's in uh, when anxiety is in the strided muscles that you get a pin, uh, the pupils, the pupils uh, become quite, quite small. And then in, 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 um, repression and in cognitive perceptual disruption, then the pupils will dilate. But that's, a, that's an anxiety reaction. It has to do with the autonomic and uh, autonomic nervous system. Now, uh, Bob, yeah. yeah. Can I elaborate on this a bit? Because I, I think I know what, what Reza is referring to. Maybe he's talking about it, you know, when you get a bit drifty and you start to, you tend to look in a certain way, you know, I look up or, you know, I look down. Um, maybe Reza can explain on this, but I think uh, he's referring to this that sometimes be, could be a sign of dissociation, getting uh, drifty. Well, and... I, yeah, I, I, meant, <clears throat> I meant one one eyeball look at one direction and the other looks at uh, the other direction at the same time. I, I don't know how, yeah, I don't know. I've never seen that. Yeah. 
I, 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 I saw it in uh, Alan Abbas's workshop when the patient yeah. uh, was in cognitive perceptual disruption. Yeah. Oh, I see that the eyes would go different ways. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I've never had that happen. Yeah. 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 But yeah, that would certainly seem to be a very unusual, but obviously some sign of anxiety, if, but I've never, never seen that. Yeah. Um, Bonnie's asking about shaking. If a patient's hand is shaking a lot. Yes. That's usually a sign of anxiety. Okay. Now, what, what are the implications then for everything I've been saying here during this uh, very long lecture? What we're seeing here is that no, no single of model will be effective with all depressed patients, right? We're seeing that a patient could be in isolation of affect, detaching from feelings, detaching from people. Since they feel detached from feelings, nothing feels meaningful since they detach from people, they have only detached relationships. As a result, a patient is going to feel depressed. It's going to be a mild depression. You can have depression that's because someone is in repression, which we'll show today, where the patient says, I love you, they hate themselves. The turning of rage on themselves will make the patient a, a depressed. We also can see fragile patients where a fragile patient is projecting and maybe thinks you don't like them thinks that you hate them, thinks that you want to attack them. That patient may feel really depressed because of how they perceive you as a projection. So this shows you that we there can't be a single treatment for a symptom of depression. We have to note that that symptom could be caused in any of a number of ways. So treatment of depression must really specify the specific pathway. If it's isolation of affect, we address that. If it's caused by repression, we work with that. If it's caused by projection, we work with that. So in other words, that treatment doesn't tr target the specific symptom. It targets the specific system of resistance that causes the symptoms. The other thing we're looking at, which Ehud touched on, is that treatment must work within the patient's level of affect tolerance, right? Fragile patients tolerate just a little bit of feeling and then they start to split project. Patients in repression can tolerate a little bit more, but then they start to go to self-attack. Patients in isolation of affect can tolerate 100% of their feelings while using isolation of affect. So patients isolation of affect, we can invite feelings at very high levels. With patients in repression, we're inviting feelings, but we're gonna do a graded form of invitation because they can't tolerate quite so much. Patients who are fragile have very low affect tolerance. So again, we'll invite feelings, but in a very graded format, it's sort of like if you went to the gym, you have some guys that can just lift just an incredible amount of weight, right? Isolation of affect. We have some people who've been lifting weights a little bit. They can't lift a lot, but they can lift some of being repression. You have some patients where they've been very, very ill and they have very little strength. And so we're gonna have them lift very tiny weights initially to build their capacity. And that would be like in fragility. So the other thing to remember here is that in ICD, we don't treat the symptom. We're trying to diagnose the cause so we can treat the cause of the symptoms. So that's why we're always gonna be evaluating at, at every patient response, where is the patient in the triangle of conflict? Did the patient offer a problem or did they get, become anxious or did they offer defense? And as we continue to do that psychodiagnosis of each patient response, we discover the patient's ability to declare a problem. We discover if the patient has a problem with anxiety that we need to, dis, uh, need to regulate. Are they in strided? Are they in smooth muscles? Are they in cognitive perceptual disruption? When they use defenses, what defenses is the patient using? What resistance system is the patient using? Then we think, how could these defenses be creating the patient's symptom? So the psychodiagnosis of the triangle of conflict in every patient response is how we then formulate the case. So we've talked about this resistance systems now, and we've talked about this continuum of affect tolerance. Now, Oh, let me just see if there's a question here. Yep. Now, 
I need to move this. Now, <clears throat> this is a very, very important concept. Basically, what we mean by threshold of anxiety tolerance is, is that the patient has some degree to intellectualize usually. Even if you're working with a, fragile, a very fragile patient, if you ask them about the soccer game that happened a couple of days ago in, uh, in, the U in the United Kingdom, where the women's soccer team won a game, even a very fragile patient will be able to intellectualize about that soccer game. If they go to the store, they'll be able to intellectualize about some food that they're buying in the grocery store. Okay, everybody has some degree uh, to use isolation of affect. Now, the question is, how much feelings can that patient tolerate before their anxiety goes out of uh, isolation of affect? Now, the highly resistant patients and moderately resistant patients that Davenu treated, those patients could tolerate 100% of their feelings in isolation of affect. There was no problem with anxiety regulation. They could just, you, you could press, you could challenge defenses, you could confront patients, their anxiety would stay in isolation of affect. That's great for that 30% of patients that can do it. Now, for patients in repression, or in, uh, or in split and projection, we, we, we can't assume that they can tolerate 100% of feelings. So when we begin asking for feelings, we're listening, can they intellectualize? And how long can they intellectualize before they shift, right? So the fragile patient may be intellectualizing and then all of a sudden they disrupt. And then since they can't tolerate the cognitive perceptual disruption, they start using splitting and projection rather than isolation of effort. The patient I'll be showing today and the one tomorrow, a sudden rise of feelings, like with this, the patient I'll show today, she could tolerate feelings for a while in isolation of effort. And where we're gonna see her is where she shifts into repression. I'll show a patient tomorrow where her feelings rose so quickly, she went into repression in like about three seconds. So she, the patient we see tomorrow has very low affect tolerance. The one we see today has a bit more. So is it a patient like a fragile patient where they can tolerate maybe 10% of the feelings before they have to split and project? Is it someone in repression can tolerate maybe 20% of the feelings before they split and project or 50%? So we're watching then as we press for feelings, we don't just press, 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 press. We're always seeing, how is she doing? How is she doing? How is she responding? Is she able to manage this? Is her structure, is her defense structure holding up? So as we continue to invite feelings, we wait. When does this patient who's using isolation effect start to have anxiety in smooth muscles? When does she start to shift into self-attack and weepiness and depression? That is the threshold of affect tolerance. So anxiety tolerance means that the patient can tolerate her feelings and anxiety sinistrated muscles. That's what we mean by anxiety tolerance, okay, affect tolerance. I can tolerate my feelings and my anxiety strike muscles. However, when the point happens that I am tolerating my feelings, but my anxiety is moving the smooth muscles or cognitive perceptual disruptions, I'm not actually able to tolerate this level of feelings. My structure is giving out, and that's why I need my therapist to come in to help support me right here where I'm starting to have some trouble. So, when we talk about threshold of anxiety tolerance and threshold of resistance, same thing, because once a patient hits that level where anxiety moves out of the smooth, out of the striated muscles into smooth muscles, that moves out of smooth muscles, resistance is also going to shift into self-attack. So that's why we're watching this so carefully, because we want to, we, where anxiety shifts out of striated muscles, where the resistance shifts out of isolation vacuum, when we see smooth muscles, and repression come in, that is where we're gonna work because that's where the patient structure gives out. That's where we need to build structure. And we're gonna build structure so that bit by bit, if she can tolerate feelings, help her tolerate, if she has trouble tolerating feelings at 20%, we can help her feel it at 20%, then we'll do pressure again. And maybe she has trouble at 25%. So we help her out until she can tolerate 25% of feelings isolation. Then we'll go to a little higher feeling. So we're basically through 
through that recapping and, and other interventions and constant pressure, we're constantly just raising that threshold of affect tolerance until a patient can tolerate all her feelings in isolation of affect, all her feelings in um, uh, strided muscles. At that point, then the patient could, uh, could benefit well from what we call the standard format of ICE-TDP. Basically with patients in repression and uh, spleen projection, they cannot work with the standard format. So we're actually building their capacity so that one day they could. So, all right, just check. Okay, Anas is asking, can the uh, anxiety shift directly from strida to CPD or always through repression of fragile patients? That's a great question, Anna. Because, uh, because in fact, it, it depends. Like if you have a fragile patient, it, depending on how fragile they are, they may, um, like a severely fragile patient, they, uh, they'll just go straight. Uh, they might go straight to splitting. You might not even see the, the, the uh, contraceptual. They'll go to straight to splitting. Moderate fragility, you'll get a little disruption and then, and then they'll go to splitting. And in mild fragility, you might just get a little, um, you might get a little cognitive perceptual disruption, but without splitting projection. Or even if they're a little better, they start going to repression, uh, they start going to smooth muscles and then cognitive perceptual disruption. So that, that would be kind of a spectrum of, of, of response that you could get in anxiety uh, symptoms with these patients, yes. And one way to deal with it too, Anna, is that sometimes if a patient is going directly from strided into cognitive perceptual disruption, that sometimes is a sign that our pressures are a little heavy and that we might need to grade our pressures to work in a little bit more gradual way because we want feelings to rise very gradually. So when the patient goes over the threshold, we can kind of bend it back down under the threshold. See, the thing is, if you're doing have pressures that are too heavy or challenges, the patient will shoot right over the threshold. And then, and then they're going to be really anxious and it's going to take a long time to get them back into the stride muscles. In repression, this is really important because if you shoot right through, if you shoot right through with repression, patient's going to get very, very depressed. I remember when I was first learning ICDP, I would have these patients where I just shooting through or I do a challenge, which is inappropriate because then these patients got really depressed. And I realized, oh, I had to make my depressions more gradual. So if we went over the threshold, we could get under the threshold right away. And I'll be showing you later how to deal with these uh, different kinds of uh, pressure. So Liron is asking, how do you determine the level of feeling, the ability to feel it in the body? I'm, I'm really using the patient's unconscious anxiety and their unconscious defenses to guide me. If the patient is sighing or tensing up, they're okay. If the patient's de defenses are in isolation of affect, we're okay. If their anxiety shifts out of strided muscles, then it's too high. If the patient's resistance shifts to repression or splitting projection, it's too high. So we, we, uh, we infer, I should say, we infer the level of feeling from the anxiety pathway and the resistance uh, system of resistance. So Marianne is asking a great question. Are the systems of resistance hierarchical so that after a therapy, you can upgrade which system of anxiety the patient is using? Yes, yes, yes. You got it. You got it. So if we can help a patient who's been splitting in projection and they are now able to start to go to repression, that's progress. If we're working with a patient who's in repression, and she's starting to intellectualize, that's progress. In the patient I'll show today, she starts out in repression, and by the end, she starts resisting me in the transference. That's progress. So yes, see, this is a, a statement that Davenu made that patients or teachers oftentimes don't mention. Remember, Davenu said, we not only structure the pathway of anxiety discharge, you've heard that, but we also restructure the system of resistance. We're trying to help a patient who's fragile shift from using splitting projection to eventually using isolation of affect. 
We're trying to restructure the system of resistance so we've upgraded it, like Mar Marianne said, to isolation of effect. If someone is in repression, right, our work isn't done until the resistance is in isolation of effect. That's our goal, right? On our good days, all of us are in isolation of effect, right? Therapy doesn't get rid of your defenses, no but it does restructure your resistance system so that you'll end up in isolation of affect. And this is why, for instance, when you read the work of Valent, remember Valent was talking about immature defenses and mature defenses. Of course, we'll use defenses, but we're helping patients move from immature defenses to mature defenses, as Valent would say, or in ICDB language, moving them from splitting projection into repression and then firmly into isolation of affect. Okay. All right. Uh, Raid says saying, what are the early signs of, of shifting, uh, shifting to repression? You're about to see that. Um, Lucy asks, is resisting the transference the same thing as avoiding uh, emotional closeness? Yes, that when the patient uh, detaches from you and it starts not working together with you and they're in isolation of affect, yeah, we would say they're avoiding emotional contact. They're avoiding emotional closeness. Yes. Very good. So, how are we doing here for time? Oh, good, just a couple more minutes. So repression, the defenses. You might ask, what's the feeling toward him for uh, leaving you? Maybe it was the right thing for him to do, right? That would be self-attack. Also, notice it says no side. Now, Raisa just asked a question. How do I know the shift in, into repression? One of the signs might be that we're no longer getting size, that the patient is shifting to self-attack right? If a patient sighs, they're going to be in isolation of affect. Now, it's true that when the patient resists in the T, sign will stop. That's a topic for another day. But let's suppose the patient is, you've got a breast patient, they're isolating affect a little bit, and then you ask what's the feeling toward him, patient doesn't sigh, maybe it was the right thing for him to do. That's your sign, okay, he, she's shifting into repression. You ask what's the feeling toward him, patient starts crying, that would be weepiness. So the tears come in to cover up the anger. And this happens unconsciously. Patient doesn't do it on purpose. Um, you might see you ask what the feeling toward him, patient slumps in the chair. That would be a sign of conversion, a complete loss of strided tone in the body, right? A complete loss of tension. Um, you might ask what's the feeling toward him for leaving you? no sigh, and the patient says, I'm getting pain in my heart. So rather than feel the anger toward him, comes back onto her, and then we see the defense of somatization. Patient has a bodily pain in herself rather than have uh, the anger toward him. So these would be classic signs of defenses and repression. So it's important to understand too, unconscious uh, repression is an un conscious mechanism. Patients don't say, oh, let me protect you from my anger. It's not like they don't know. They don't know they're engaging self-attack. They don't know that the, in the relationship, they're protecting you. They don't realize, oh, I am an acting an early insecure attachment, right? Because that's what it is. Self-attack is the attachment system. Oh, I need to protect you from my anger patient unconsciously enacts that attachment pattern and it happens automatically, unconsciously. This is extremely important to really understand the presentation today that we're really looking at resistance system that's unconscious, defenses, unconscious. All right, so I see, I think we're up to break time. Is that right, Yuval? We have 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes, oh, we have a half hour. Oh, okay, great. All right, so then it's time for me to stop this and let me pull something up here. All right.
Oh, Gorgon is asked, is weeping is always covering up anger or also covering up sadness, grief as well? That is mixed feelings. Well, weepiness would not be covering up sadness because it's already sadness. But what we can do is think functionally. When does weepiness come in? So and see, why did that come in now? What was happening before that made weepiness come in? So in that sense, we could do the analysis of process. We say, okay, when this comes up, what happened next? When this weepiness came up, what would its function be? Did this weepiness help a feeling come up or did it inhibit a feeling come up? So we'll have a chance to assess that when we watch the video. Okay, now I'm gonna see if I can get my share screen to work here. Okay. So <clears throat> a patient has come to the psychiatrist's office. Okay, now this patient you see here has been abused very badly abused uh, by its parents. And so the, the uh, patient has come to the psychiatrist, otherwise known as a veterinarian. So let's see, now that this patient has come to the therapy session, how does this abused patient relate to the therapist? <laughs> So the therapist approaches the patient, trying to form a bond of emotional closeness to help the patient. <laughs> All right. What's that emotion? Can you do it together? <sighs> What's that emotion? Anybody? Somebody volunteer. There must Anger. be some. Anger. Anger. Bravo. 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 Good. So now, interesting, you've all heard of Charles Darwin, right? He wrote this amazing book on, on evolution, right? What you may not know is 1872, he wrote a book on emotions in animals because he noted that there's clearly emotions in animals. And, and since that time, we see a lot of evidence for emotions in animals and dogs, of course, and of course in primates. Franz van der Waals has looked at this. This is really quite amazing. So now, <clears throat> this is a transference feeling. I'm going to say it again. This is what we mean by transference scene. This dog was abused. And so when it meets another homo sapiens, it's anticipating abuse and it's having a transference reaction. That's what we call a transference scene. <laughs> now, the dog is, does, is not able to isolate affect. The dog is not able to use repression, right? It's just, it just, it feels the same directly. You're gonna hurt me. Right. This, these now these unconscious reactions happen to all of us. Remember, all of us have a reptilian brain, the and the mammalian brain, and then human brain. Human brain is only a few millimeters thick, right? Otherwise, it's just reptile and dog reaction going on underneath, which we can cover up with just the tiniest bit of isolation of effort. But every patient who's been abused comes into your office with that reaction. So let's see how the dog handles its conflict with the psychiatrist. Okay, what, what emotion is this? Fear. Exactly, right. So we have anger and fear right? This anxiety that comes up. Now, the child initially has a fear reaction to the parent. And then learns, oh, my anxiety is going to trigger my parent. So the child becomes anxious about feelings. Because if she can hide the feelings, that she won't have to be afraid of the parent. 
So what we have here is this, there's anger and there's fear. Oh, this could be dangerous. And what do we see? The dog starts to defecate. Its anxiety goes into the smooth muscles. De it's defecating, defecating right now. See, this is an anxiety regulation, anxiety, anxiety response. So the veterinarian picks up the dog. See, I need to move this a little bit here. Yeah, okay. So he's petting the dog. See, and the dog starts to lick him. Okay, so this really helps you see that when we talk about transference reactions and feelings rising, it's really an unconscious animal process that's evoked in, in, in every human. And we're just seeing abused dog that feels the transference feeling of anger, he becomes scared, anxiety goes into the smooth muscles, right? And so he soothes, soothes the dog. Now, in, in, uh, in our work with patients, it's more complex because we're gonna have to address the defense, we have to regulate the anxiety, of course, for our patients, because they're going to, their gut is oftentimes going to react like this dog's gut. It's an animal reaction. And we have to help them with the defenses because the, the dog just only learns to bark. Humans, I need to survive, so I can't just growl at my parents. So I've got to hide my anger in order to protect the relationship, even if it means turning on myself. So we actually have to not only restructure the defense, we're having to restructure the whole way of relating. Because in a way, when we invite feelings, we're basically saying to patients, you don't have to hurt yourself to be with me. You don't have to protect me from your anger. We can have a different relationship. So, Lisa is saying this part is so painful to watch. It really is. And the, and the important thing, Lisa, is that that's the inner pain of the patients. Right, that come to us. This is their circle. That's why we're paying attention to their stomach, their any anxiety regulation. And that's why we're paying attention to their defenses so they don't have to attack themselves to protect us. Um, Ram says, does transference involve projection? Yes, um, but that's a very long and complex question for me to answer, but let me put it in a very simple way. In, in transference, a patient is not projecting a feeling inside them onto you. They're not projecting a wish from them onto you. It's not like projection splitting. In the transference, the patient projects an image of someone onto you. The patient imagines you're gonna be like my mother. You're gonna be like my father. So projection is the projection of an image of a person onto you. And then they react to you as if you're that mother or father or someone else. Okay, now I think, I think we made it. Uh, let's see, there's one more question. Okay, oh, so, yeah. okay, so we're gonna have a 20 minute break. And after this massive lecture that you've endured, we'll finally go to the case. See you in 20 minutes. <laughs>